Buenos dias, hola, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the welcome, uh, Beppe. Uh, as Beppe says, I am a, a co-founder with him and, uh, and Dennis Chekin of Via Nortis, uh, as we now call it. It is a nanomedicine company. Uh, why am I qualified to do this? Well, I am a serial entrepreneur. I founded uh, companies beforehand. I have had a, um, an ophthalmology company, which I eventually exited, which is the uh, uh, goal of every investor. Uh, and I have been involved in um, uh, CNS companies and oncology companies, so those are the key therapeutic areas. In terms of prior to that, I have worked in product development, taking products from the bench all the way to the market. And this is an important perspective to have when founding companies. So, how did I get involved in this? Uh, I was asked to come along and uh, meet uh, Beppe and uh, Dennis uh, at University College in London to talk about a nanotechnology that they were saying had great capability. So what did I find when I got there? First of all, we had a polymer nanoparticle system. So this was different to the lipid nanoparticles and other ve um, vehicles that you can see for delivering um, materials. Uh, the second thing that I saw was that there was quite a lot of data which was supporting small molecules, um, proteins and peptides, and antibodies. And predominantly, this was delivering to the brain or to tumors. And those were the two particular areas that there was, at that time, data. It was also a good understanding of mechanism of action. But there was more than that, in fact. Um, there were several amounts of uh, commercial type of um, information. Um, <clears throat> and particularly, um, they had used it for delivering dyes and probes to live cells, so basically as a laboratory agent. And this had been well received, as there were quite a lot of advantages of using the technology in that scenario. Um, <clears throat> there were patents filed, um, which was another advantage. And uh, there was also active interest from a number of pharmaceutical companies that Beppe had been working with. So the scene looked pretty fair, in fact, to, um, to think about commercialization. So the first thing that I said was, OK, what are we going to deliver in this um, interesting delivery system? And Beppe's answer is, whatever you want. We can do a lot of different things. But in terms of business, we can't do anything and change our minds. We have to uh, decide on one particular modality or one particular type of molecule, and hence one particular type of therapeutic area, or at the maximum two, and then move on with, uh, with, with translating that particular product. So uh, translation is always about products. We want to get um, products through and products to the market and interest um, people in that. So we looked at what the capabilities were that were known at that time, because I'm talking about seven or eight years ago now. And as I've said, there were dyes and probes. That seemed very promising. It was something that we could do and was being done. The second thing was, was small molecules, and in particular in the area of oncology. So in the first and second iterations of our business plan, we um, look to utilize those, um, uh, those modalities. However, um, as we've gone through, and as I'm going to relate as we go through this lecture, um, we have eventually moved into the de delivery of genetic materials, and I will explain why in a, in a while. So at this point, I'm going to um, take a step into the science. Um, this is what I would call a business take on the science, rather than the, the deep scientific take on the science. But it's how I found you need to present it to people that are non-expert, but have a good interest and have seen lots of things before. So, sorry, I'm just making the technology work. Um, <coughs> so, um, the first thing um, to just get down to the basics of the, um, of the technology. By this time, we had decided to call the, the, the technology polynaut, 
Um, it's always really quite important to give something to hang around a name so that um, investors and other people that are associated really know what, they're, what we're talking about. So I will refer to this technology as Polynaut, and it's, uh, we trademarked that, um, and uh, it has been a constant throughout this development process. So here we have the vesicles. Um, they're generally about 100 nanometers in diameter, uh, and they have a very tight dispersity. So <coughs> the vesicle itself is formed of two um, two polymers, two dye block polymers, one hydrophilic, one hydrophobic. And this is one of the advantages of this technology, is that we are able to do this very predictably, and, um, and that is good from a pharmaceutical point of view, because when we come to manufacture, that's something that um, we're going to have to set specifications around. So, what can we say polynaut is? So, I like to describe this as a bespoke drug platform, drug delivery platform, which means it isn't one single thing. There is a choice of polymer, there is a choice of targeting, there is a choice of, um, of, of payload. So we call it an umbrella technology, um, <clears throat> and um, we have several features that we, means we are able to um, tackle several different types of payloads. So when we have formed our vesicles, um, we have a vesicle that is very, very flexible. It's ultra-deformable. Um, and we say it's very capable, and part of that definition, if you like, is that it, we can take lots of different payloads, not absolutely anything, but, num but um, a sufficient range that it makes it very interesting. And the third aspect um, that we've um, focused on is that we can target those vesicles with, um, uh, by functionalizing the surface of the vesicle um, with peptide ligands, which are specific for, for specific cell surface receptors. And we call that phenotypic targeting. So between these factors, we're able to put interesting payloads, we're able to target um, this vesicle to the cells of interest. So here, we also understand what the mechanism of action is, and this is something that um, uh, people like to home in on, they like to understand, um, do you know how this works? So in terms of um, entering the cell, it is by endocytosis, um, in, um, forms an early endosome, and then we get, an, um, uh, with a change of pH or other factors, we get, a we get an instant release of the cargo into the, into the cell cytoplasm. So this instant release is um, also a very big strength of the polynaut technology. Um, targeting is something that um, has excited a lot of interest in our investor groups. And we describe this as phenotypic targeting. And it is an unusual type of targeting which has been um, developed in Beppe's academic labs. And um, we, uh, it is a low affinity or a quite low affinity multivalent binding. Um, we can also put several different types of ligand on the surface so that we multiplex. So we can effectively create a barcode. And this is important because if we can go into one cell type that's expressing, let's just say, the LRP1 receptor, um, there are lots of cells that express LRP1, but we need to go to the ones that we want to go to, and therefore you have to look at, the, at the, where the different populations of receptors are. And the third thing that we can do is to exert steric control. Now, the way that the, uh, the vesicle is formed, it, has, it isn't a smooth surface. It has a, um, a polymer brush type surface, which <coughs> um, allows us, as the, as the vesicle approaches the, the receptors, to exert some control through steric control. So we have many levers here to be able to, um, <coughs> uh, to uh, get to our target that we want to do. In addition to that, we have a third aspect to our technology, which has really come into the fore in the last couple of years when we've been delivering genetic materials. And this is what we call go-to. 
It is a, something that we complex with the encapsulated cargo. So before we encapsulate the cargo, we complex with GO2. And well, after disassembly, after we've administered the material, it's got to it into the cell it, uh, and disassembles. This GO2 technology then shuttles that material to the site of action. For example, if it's a PDNA, it goes into the nucleus. And this is um, really increasing the expression, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data on that in a moment. Uh, oh, I'm going to show it to you now, I've forgotten the slide came straight after. So this is where um, we have um, a, a go-to technology with um, a PDNA that has been encapsulated, and um, we are seeing um, a normalized uh, nanoliciferase expression with a 20-fold increase at 48 hours. And so you can see the difference between the light pink bar and the dark pink bar. So it's very, very effective. Um, in terms of genetic materials, which, as I indicated, is where we're going um, with, the, um, with the technology, we have um, a very good uh, delivery of siRNA, and in comparison to other types of technologies, such as a lipid nanoparticle, we are getting a big amount of delivery, and we're getting it very concentrated into the cell. Here, obviously, the nucleus is in, um, is in um, blue. So we have many advantages of the technology. But more than that, we have in vivo data, and this data excites a lot of interest. Um, it is um, some data that was generated with a nanoparticle that had encapsulated a compound, um, a platinum compound. This was convenient because we were able to not only um, quantify the platinum compound, but also image the, the, um, the platinum compound without any additional fluorescent tagging. And this, um, we have done a biodistribution study. And the bars on the left are showing that once we have the targeting, we get an enormous amount of material into the brain, about 15% of the injected dose. Bear in mind that most intravenous administrations are getting less than 1%, uh, probably less than that. So this is a stunning result. And just to sort of show where it is, the bar on the right there um, is showing without targeting, there is very little delivered. Um, the set of graphs on the right, uh, the far right, shows the comparative biodistribution to several different types of organs peripherally and to the brain. And effectively, you're seeing a little bit in the spleen, you're seeing a little bit in the liver, but the vast majority, when you've got a targeted formulation, is ending up in the, in the brain. If we don't have that targeting, it's all over the place. In fact, the majority is going into the, into the spleen and liver, which is something that, we, that we'd very much expect. So this data um, has been very instrumental in getting um, a lot of uh, interest from um, investor groups, which I'm going to say a bit more in a moment. Um, in terms of the, where our interests have landed up, which is delivering genetic materials, um, because the question can be if you're delivering a small molecule, but can you do it with something that's a bit bigger and a bit more uh, difficult? And uh, this um, data is showing that in a mouse model, we have put um, about 10% of PDNA at 72 hours into the, into the brains of mice. So the two panels of the images um, on the left are the control, which you can effectively see there's not very much at all, and we have very brightly lit brains for the PDNA group. So we have proof positive that, we're that this uh, technology is able to do that. Uh, going further, because as we have gone through this process over the years, we have refined the business plan, and we have looked um, to focus on delivering to the CNS, which has always been a strength of the technology. And um, one of the questions that we get asked very often is about um, biodistribution within the brain. And this um, uh, set of experiments is showing that we have a distribution in different areas of the brain. We have the hippocampus um, and other areas of the brain at uh, three different time points, 10, 30, and 60 minutes. 
and we can see that initially um, we're aligned with the uh, polynaut is in red, <coughs> excuse me, um, is in red and is quite well aligned in the top, uh, the top left um, uh, bars. Uh, with the blood vessels, and as we go through, it becomes dispersed into the, in, in, into the different areas. This, again, has been very important and useful data that we've used. Uh, but we also did not want to be completely confined to the brain, and we had other areas that we wanted to be sure to showcase, and these data um, have similar effect in doing that. The top bars are about um, delivering to a, a gastric uh, cancer cells, and um, we've coined the phrase cancer penetrating, so we have three phrases, brain penetrating, cancer penetrating, and immunopenetrating. So these are other areas that we keep and we will be um, going for um, at a later time point. So um, in the round, we are showcasing delivery to the brain um, through um, delivery over the, over the blood-brain barrier through transcytosis and ultimately different brain cells. Then, um, secondly, um, into um, uh, tumours, cancer, particular, particularly good data on brain tumours and particularly good data on peritoneum, immune cells, and then specific tissues, so we can target lung or we could target kidney, and those are other areas that we're, that we're looking at. In terms of delivering um, genetic materials, um, siRNA um, is of great interest, um, particularly commercially. There are many companies that are working on it. And this is, uh, this is some um, recently generated in vitro data in our laboratories in Cambridge, um, showing that we are getting um, high cellular uptake of polynaut siRNA, which, is in, which are the red dots there. So this is proof positive, if you like, and very encouraging data for us. And in a similar vein, we've looked at mRNA, um, because the modalities offer quite a lot of different challenges. I'm afraid the, um, the images are reversed here, so that the, the green is what you're looking for to see that mRNA is, is in fact delivered. So, this is the background of the science that um, uh, we look to take forward and take out into the commercial world and begin to look at the translation of. And um, we started the spin-out process of the Polynaut technology from UCL in London in uh, 2018. So we started with um, uh, Plan One, which was uh, what we describe as a hybrid business model. And going back to what I said at the beginning about um, imaging live cells, this was a possibility for an, an easy and a quick win. So the hybrid nature of this model is that we offered laboratory um, products for sale, either through our own, through our own um, sales networks or with a partner, and undertake an internal pipeline of development. Now, when we took this business plan out, which had played very well in some of my former companies, by the time we reached um, 2018, when we were doing this, um, we found that investors were either interested in the quick win revenue, i.e. the laboratory products, or they were interested in the, in the internal development, because they're, they're very different um, type of funding requirements. If we wanted to have um, laboratory products, we would just need some money to set up sales or get a partner. But for internal development, we needed deep-pocketed investors. And they really didn't seem to fall into the same buckets. So we decided to leave that part um, of it, move on to plan two, which was to just take the internal pipeline development and to develop um, an on oncology pipeline. Uh, we had some compelling data, both in um, glioblastoma models and in peritoneal, and um, we took this out for funding. The issue that we had with that 
was that we were encapsulating doxorubicin, which although for, particularly for brain tumors, was not, um, uh, was, um, not indicated, but if it could pass the blood-brain barrier, could be highly efficient. But this didn't seem to excite, and it wasn't a, a, a fashion. People wanted something that was a bit more, a bit more, um, uh, ha had a bit more novelty about it. And so, um, after trying extremely hard, we decided that we could um, we could not um, pursue that simply because we couldn't get funding. So. Um, we then come into what has proved to be an extremely successful offering, which um, is uh, we started off offering uh, what we would call services, and the company was called SomaServe, and we, um, <coughs> we offered to work with pharmaceutical partners with their payloads to take away the objection that we didn't have novel payloads, um, and we also um, attracted the interest of Abcam, who if you all work in the labs, you, I expect you use Abcam materials. But Abcam decided they would invest in us. So back came into the picture the laboratory reagents. So we undertook uh, seed rounds of funding, um, and uh, they, we started off attracting interest of, um, of pharmaceutical companies, particularly to deliver to the brain and um, of Abcam, who started to sell Polynaut products. And if you go on the Abcam website today, you will see there are several dye products um, that have great advantages for lab work. So we did two seed fund funding rounds, one at 500, um, or, 600, uh, five or 600,000 pounds, um, which just literally got us going into liftoff. And then later, we did a second round. But what has really worked has been um, moving into, uh, fairly and squarely, into delivering genetic materials. Uh, and that has excited interest both of investors and of the um, uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, company environment. So, in terms of raising money, um, it seems to be what I spend my whole time doing. Um, there are many ways of doing this. There are many um, potential outlets. If, if you want small amounts of money, you can go to business angels, you can go to um, friends and family, and that's a very common thing that people put their hands in their pockets. Um, there are networks, there are high net, individu high net worth individuals who um, think what you're doing is interesting and prepared to put in a small amount of money. And there's also crowdfunding, which is becoming more popular, but not particularly suitable for what we do. So for the seed rounds, that's what we did. For the Series A, we're moving up the scale into much bigger funds, into, into venture capital funds, into pharma companies. Um, <clears throat> so uh, going back for a moment to our plan one, we approached probably 20, 30, could even be 40 different um, investors no term sheet. So a term sheet is when they are beginning to be interested. They uh, say, I want to, uh, we're, we're interested in investing. They give you an amount they want to invest and they give you a valuation and those things are all put down in a term sheet. And that's what you're looking for in the first instance. So we got no term sheets at plan one, we got no term sheets at plan two, despite a lot of compelling data. So then um, we went through we changed the business plan, and um, the result is um, was that we got lift off effectively um, with our with our funding, which was very important and very instrumental to where we have landed today. And this is the PR that we got out of the latest funding round. Um, Endpoints is a trade magazine which is international, and we got the support of two pharmaceutical companies, UCB and, um, and Belgian company and um, the biggest by market cap, Eli Lilly, have backed our raise. So this is, we have, um, we have landed. Um, we also got local Cambridge UK um, <coughs> um, coverage of the, uh, of the funding round. I think what's interesting about these headlines and why I put them up there is what they pick up. And when you come back to how do you hook people into, into funding things, the local one picks up on Polynaut. 
So polynaut is always a very important um, uh, way in for us. The more international one picks up two pharmaceutical companies and also the fact that we're going to develop genetic nanomedicines. <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> um, here we go with the key facts of, of the Anortis today. Uh, we're founded in, in, in 2018. We have IP, which we've licensed from the Tech Transfer Office in UCL. Um, we have uh, now got established laboratories um, in one of the research parks in Cambridge. Uh, <clears throat> I've talked about the business model, and you've heard also about the investment. So we now describe ourselves as a growth stage business, advancing to preclinical. Our goal is to get to, is to get to the um, is to get to the clinic, but we have to take the steps as we can. Um, <clears throat> so we now have a mission to transform the lives of patients that can't get their genetic diseases treated in any other way because there is no way to get the materials. Our strategy is to exploit as widely as we can the Polynaut platform, and we're doing that by our internal pipeline and by working with um, pharmaceutical partners. So just a little on our pipeline. I won't go through this in too much detail, but this is a typical pharma pipeline. Uh, we have two internal pi uh, programs at the top, one in cystic fibrosis and, <clears throat> um, and one in a CNS rare disease. The bottom parts in the darker purple are various collaborations that we have. So just to say, why did we choose cystic fibrosis and targeting the lung? We, <clears throat> we started discussions with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the United States. They decided that they wanted to invest in us because they want to deliver mRNA or even gene editing. Um, <clears throat> they have little ways of doing it. They are quite cash rich, and they thought that it was interesting to invest in us. So we've started a, um, a cystic fibrosis program. There are many advantages to our doing that, and I could go into those, but I'm um, advised I'm getting a bit time short here. <clears throat> uh, we are looking to push this program um, with a mutation agnostic approach to the, um, uh, to the clinic in about six or seven years, which seems a long time frame, but nonetheless, um, it's a realistic one. I want to say just a little bit about the competitive landscape because this is something that always comes up when you go to investor meetings. They always pop up. Well, have you heard of this company and they're doing this? And we need to be able to have good answers to that. The two main categories of competitors that um, we have here are lipid nanoparticles and AAVs. Um, we win against both of those on many of the counts that we have um, uh, that we can be judged by, which includes immunogenicity. So um, lipid nanoparticles are well known. Um, they try to reduce immunogenicity by functionalizing surface with PEG, but they can't really get enough to do a very good job on that. AAVs, of course, is well known that we can dose once, but after that, you cannot, um, uh, you cannot um, go further than that. Um, intracellular delivery <coughs> is, um, uh, is, is important as part of our mechanism of action. AAVs are, um, are, are, have the same mechanism of action, of course, but that is more difficult from the LMP point of view. Um, targeting is a very important part of our USP. Um, lipid nanoparticles can be targeted to some extent, but not as much as, uh, and as specifically and directly as we can. So, um, also to talk about IP, um, we have licensed five patent families from UCL, um, <clears throat> which is um, highly important to have the control over our IP. We started filing our own IP, we've got new filings planned, we have trademarks, as I mentioned, around the Polynaut technology and know-how. Investors will not invest if you have not got your um, technology protected. And so, um, just to summarize, I feel like I've gone very quickly through these things, but um, how we are advancing to preclinical development. We're taking a pipeline um, for um, the wide exploitation of, of Polynaut, 
for brain targeting, for lung targeting, and then with partners. We have a number of conversations going on with partners, um, pharmaceutical companies predominantly, that want to really um, uh, maximize the amount of um, uh, the, the, the possibilities of their utilizing their technologies in the form of cargos. Um, Polynaut comprises polymer vesicle targeting and the go-to technology. Um, and most importantly, we believe that we win against the competition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fran. It was a very nice presentation. It was started really with the end of the, the, the <laughs> journey. When you translate technology, <laughs> that's uh, the best way to start the conference. Uh, questions for Fran? Have we got about 10 minutes to ask as many questions as you want? There is one there. And then another one here. Hello. Neil Thomas, University of Nottingham. Um, so a very interesting talk. I was interested in the difficulties with the platform of getting through the regulatory barrier mm -hmm. later on, because obviously you're going to have to go through it many different times if you're delivering many different things. How would you actually handle that? And the other question I had was, what's the fate of the um, polynaut system sure. when it degrades? Thank you. Sure. Uh, so regulatory-wise, um, I mean, uh, uh, Platform technologies always have that hurdle, particularly on the first occasion that you present a product uh, that um, uh, utilizes that technology. Um, once you have that settled down, there is the possibility to establish precedent in terms of tox data. Um, <clears throat> we would be looking probably to DMF the, um, uh, the, the polymer so that we can utilize that in multiple, multiple filings. If you look at liposomes, for example, which are lipid nanoparticles that have been fairly successful, there have been multiple products, and I think the process becomes a little, a little more speedy. But in addition to that, the, many of the components of Polynaut have already got um, either uh, grass status generally recognized as safe, or they are in the US Orange Book. So we have a sort of head start there. Uh, we're not using anything weird and wonderful, which I think the regulators don't like weird. So um, I think we are a ways off that. We will be taking um, a, a long run at, um, at uh, dialogue with the, with the regulators. It's one of the reasons that we want to start with, um, uh, with orphan indications, because uh, we get a lot of input from the regulators at an earlier stage. So um, it is my background. I've been in most of the regulators. I've been in FDA. I've been in um, most of the EMA countries. So I do know the challenges of that, but appreciate the question. Um, in terms of uh, the biodegradability of the polymer, um, it's basically broken down into facile um, uh, components such as uh, lactic acid and, and other parts that will um, participate in um, and just be excreted renally. So uh, it's pretty nice from that point of view. There's not anything that's hanging around. And there was a question here from, from uh, Seb. Yeah, th th thanks a lot, Francisca, and thanks for sharing you know, all this uh, ex experience with us. Um, I have a question regarding the, the ch choice of, uh, of the um, 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 orientation of the technology towards the delivery of genetics. Uh, it seems that it's driven by the market and basically by the, uh, the, the funding that you can raise. But is it initially the, you know, what you would have done uh, without considering that? I mean, is it what the technology is, is better or, or good at? Uh, well, it's an interesting question and one that's been much debated. And uh, I think the problem is that if you are not getting uh, commercial traction, you don't get anywhere. And with Business Plan 2, when we had doxorubicin, we had terrific clinical support. People wanted that product. We had, um, uh, they were really extremely, extremely interested. But this didn't really cut anything. And without the cash to proceed, we had no possibility to do that. And that would have been a splendid product, without a doubt. Um, so, 
this is what I call the art of the possible. Um, and <laughs> you have to um, look. Now, if it had been impossible to deliver genetic materials, then obviously it wasn't something that we could, we could entertain. But the world has moved into it. There are numerous companies. I mean, there's an Anil Island, there's um, CoBio. Um, we can go on enumerating. Um, and this is, this is where the action is. Um, yes, is it perfect? No. We have, uh, we have now to try and recapitulate platinum data with a genetic payload. And that is absolutely of itself much, much more difficult, much more challenging. But we now have deep-pocketed um, uh, investors, and that makes a terrific difference. So we've just upscaled our team in Cambridge from 12, as it was in November, to at the beginning of February, it's going to be uh, 25 people. So, you know, we have uh, a lot of weight on that, plus big collaboration here in, um, in Barcelona with, um, with Beppe and his laboratory, which is um, just in the process of being done. So there's a lot of weight being thrown at this to make uh, genetic materials work. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think we've got a question there in the back and then Samuel there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Patricia Juarez from Mexico. Um, that was very beautiful. Thank you very much to go through all the process, not just for the science. So the, the data is very impressive about the, the system, the pulling out system with the targeting for the brain is really impressive. So I know that you cannot say what are you using. <laughs> However, I, I, I was wondering how, how do you manage that specificity? Because usually when we target is proteins that are in the body or in the organs and is, is the, the most of them are common to different kind of tissues. So it was really impressive what is the specificity for the brain. And the second question is that what do you do after that? Because it seems like it's really targeting. So yes. after what happened after 30 minutes? Yes, so I, 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 I think that Beppe needs to answer this question. <laughs> it's your presentation. Isn't it? <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of, of, um, of brain, um, <clears throat> we have um, uh, discovered that we can go into the brain by cytosis, and we do that um, <clears throat> with one particular ligand. And it has just proved to be particularly effective. Uh, there are other possible um, uh, there are other possible ligands that we can uh, that we can use, um, particularly transferrin. Um, but we are targeting on um, on um, uh, using one particular peptide. Uh, in terms of afterwards, when it's delivered. Because we have the ability to functionalize the surface with um, uh, with more different ligands, we can put up to five different ligands on the surface. So therefore, you can have one for one job and one for another job, or two or three. Um, the, some of the things that I talked about, about um, the actual specificity, it isn't only the nature of the, of the ligand and the, and the binding of the surface, at the cell surface receptor. It's also the steric approach, it's also the um, density of the, of, the, of, the, of the receptors. So, I mean, as I said um, during the course of the talk, the um, LRP1, for example, is expressed very, very widely, and to avoid binding very, very widely, you need to take the specific population that you have, um, uh, that you have there um, that you're trying to get through. So, I mean, I think it's a more detailed answer than um, I can do in, um, in, in two or three minutes, but we could talk about it, and I'd be Thank happy you. to do that. I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have only time for two quick questions. There's one on the back there, and then Martin. Sorry, if you don't mind, I put my pass on this question during the, the coffee break. We already ran out of time, apologies, yes. I'm glad to see that it's Samuel. Yeah, thank you. Samuel from IBEC here in Barcelona. Uh, congratulations for uh, rising this Series A. Um, thank you. The startup is great. Um, I'm in an earlier stage, in the same way like closing the first round, and now we're talking to VCs, and they normally ask for this mechanism of action, which seems to be very trending. And uh, how much, and you put, put here with just one slide, and how much detail you give to the VCs on the mechanism of action, and the second question is, is this regarding the API that you are transferring, or is about the nanoparticle itself, what they want to hear? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, 
Second question first, it's very much about the, about the nanoparticle. I mean, we have not been, uh, we will not develop our own payloads, and so the questions to us come about yeah, the vesicle. Sure. Um, I'm sure there will be another layer of questions on, on, um, on payload. Um, in terms of um, uh, detail of mechanism of action, we haven't had too much questioning. When we lay out what I, that's why I put it actually into this slide, just to say that's how uh, we see the mechanism of action. It had been elucidated very well already in the, in, um, uh, the laboratories of, 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 of Beppe. And that, I, I think, they, I find that VCs get hung up on particular points. And sometimes if they get hung up onto mechanism of action, then they'll go, go, go on it. But then it, they, may, they may go, go, go on something else. And um, it's get, trying to get out of that, uh, that, that one. We were lucky they didn't go too much. They kind of accepted it and ticked. <laughs> um, but we had questions on a lot of other things. The, the due diligence is, is very, very onerous. There's no doubt. A very quick one, yes? Okay, so we have to be very quick. Um, yes. Part of your success is a delivery, but part is... I'm here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> part of success is how, how well or how selective you target to your, to your targets, to your different cells. And you have chosen to look into brain, lung, and then also the immune polynuts. So I was wondering, how do you define what to target on those three different cell types and how, um, how truly phenotypic uh, selective are you? Uh, so we, uh, the, the brain is the area that we have worked on quite specifically and of course there's sort of two parts of that. One is going over the blood-brain barrier and so that's the LLP1 um, and transcytosis part of the story. In terms of lung, we are only just at the very beginning of starting to work on that, so we need to be um, targeting on epithelial lung cells. And that is a whole new program of work. That, um, so we have um, now got um, machine learning, bioinformatics, that completely um, follow that, that path. And it is specific to, to, to each different thing. Uh, and it's very... Um, uh, and to that extent, we need to, um, uh, to get it um, <coughs> informed with as much data as we possibly can from, um, from, from outside sources and tested through quite big com computer programs. So it is, um, it is a sort of part of the USP, if you would like, that we are able to do this. Um, we're also looking at starting a programme on kidney as well, um, so there's, there's, there's quite a bit. But that will really stretch things in, in, in terms of what we look to be able to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me to thank Fran again for the talk. <laughs>